Okay, um, let me, uh, without further delay, let me introduce our first speaker, who is uh, no stranger to many of us, because he's been back here many times. So please welcome David Cook. Yeah. Good morning, David. How Good are morning. you? Good morning, Kay. Oh, I'm well, thank you. David, this is uh, trip number... You've uh, stopped counting. Yes, I've got no idea. I, th I think this morning, um, um, uh, or rather last night, my wife and I, we were uh, trying to recount how many visits David uh, to this platform. We think this is probably the seventh time he's in Malaysia and the sixth time he's actually uh, speaking at a KVBC event. So we, uh, mm. we are very glad to welcome you Thank back. Thank you very much. David, um, can you share with us a little bit, um, some of them uh, perhaps meeting you for the first time, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, your family and what is it in your current ministry? Well, I'm married to my wife Maxine. We've been married for 45 years. We have five adult children, 13 grandchildren. Uh, we're rejoicing that our last grandchild was our first Cook grandchild. So our son and his wife had a little boy called Cook, surname Cook, that's lovely. His first name is Gail, though. We're a bit surprised by that. Uh, so uh, we rejoice in a lovely family. And there we have one child in the United States, three ch children in Sydney, and, uh, and uh, one in Brisbane, in Queensland. David, now, uh, David, you and I were in Kuching just uh, last weekend. Yeah. And I think some people were a bit uh, uh, curious about your last name, Cook. Do yes. you have any particular... Uh, special traits, uh, special family secrets, why is your family named Cook? Uh, well, I guess because my great-grandfathers, etc., were named Cook. <laughs> all, all my forebears came from Scotland, and the ones we can trace back came from the lowlands of Scotland on my father's side. They were the Cooks, and the Gauls were from Aberdeen. Uh, so I guess three generations ago, I would have been a Scot. Oh, there you mm. go. So no relations to James, Captain James Cook? No, no none that oh. we know. <laughs> So he didn't ill-treat any prisoners uh, to Australia? No, no he, he, well, he didn't bring any convicts to Australia. Oh. But, uh, because Captain Arthur Phillip came with the first oh. fleet. But so the British were great colonisers and they established a wonderful colony uh, which was firmly based on Judeo-Christian ethic, Christian ethical principles. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. My, my Australian history is a little bit suspect. Mm. Okay, um, David, you've been doing ministry of training pastors and preachers for many years now. Can you just uh, share with us a little bit over the years and especially in these last few years, is there anything in particular that you think preachers, pastors, teachers need particular encouragement and training on? Oh, well, they need to keep encouraging, hashtag preach the word, encouraged to do that. Um, someone asked me the other day, do I think preaching is important? I said, no, I think preaching the word is important, expository preaching is important, which takes the Bible seriously and uh, deals with the text seriously. And so I guess preachers always need an encouragement to be people of twin respects. They respect the word of God and they put it in its context and they seek to understand it very carefully and then they respect their congregation. They seek to communicate it to them in terms they can understand and apply it and show how it would work out in life. So those twin respects I think are very important for us. So not just preaching but preach the word. Preach the word, it makes yeah. all the that's difference. what Paul says isn't it? 2 Timothy 4, preach the word. Don't mm. preach you, don't preach your political thoughts, don't preach anything else but preach the word. Thank you. David, can you perhaps then share with us a little bit uh, something that personally has been encouraging you? Uh, what help keeps you going, preaching the word in season, out of season? Uh, just when I see that people are transformed through the word. Um, I'll give you an example of that. My son was married and he married a South African girl. His best man was a Buddhist. His best mate from school was a man called Ka Ken Wong. And Ka Ken was a Buddhist. And uh, at the service, of the marriage service, uh, Frank Retief, who was at that time uh, leading the church in South Africa, the Church of England, preached the gospel very clearly. Frank is a great evangelist. And at the end of the service, Ka Ken said to me, Mr. Cook, I think I've become a Christian after mm. hearing that. And I said, that's wonderful. And he said, when we get back to Australia, would you read the Bible with me? So for, for a full 12 months on a Wednesday night, we just sat down, very intelligent young Chinese fellow, 
and read the Bible. And every week he would say, tell me again about justification. That is the great truth. And for the mind of the Buddhist, that is an amazing truth. Mm. And, and the challenge for me was to tell him next week and last week ju about justification in a slightly different way, I thought, to keep his interest. Uh, and he was getting so excited about justification. And then I thought, well, why don't I get more excited about justification? Mm. And I think in those times, see him grow, mm. he's now established and actively mm. involved in a local church. Mm. And, of, of course, for a Buddhist to get them ready when they've come to Christ, mm. to make sure they understand justification, but also that they have real expectations mm. about the sort of opposition that they're going to face mm. for their Christian walk. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It's encouraging, isn't it? When we preach the word, God's word never returns to him empty mm. without accomplishing his purpose, mm. transforming lives. Thank you, David. Thank you. One of my sons in growing up always had a great fascination with African wildlife and on one occasion I was invited to go to South Africa and when Ben, my son, was 19 years old I said, would you like to come and after I speak uh, we could go on an animal safari. So uh, off we went and we went to the Kruger National Park and we were in a safari vehicle which was a Nissan and I noticed immediately that it didn't start first time every time. It was open-sided. There were about eight other people with us and we had a guide. And out we went on the first morning and turned a corner and we were immediately confronted by a herd of elephants. And one particular elephant, a bull elephant, about five tons, took an interest in us. He started stomping on the ground. With his trunk he started throwing dust in the air, flapped his ears, and he came for us. Our guide, who turned the car engine off, said, don't worry, they're mostly bluffing. All I heard was mostly. And I thought, start the engine. Well, he did start the engine and we were away. He was bluffing indeed. But I thought, that, that's interesting. I've never had an experience like that before. In Australia, you don't get charged by elephants when you turn a corner. Um, in Australia, you go to the zoo and you're entertained by elephants or you see them as an object of pity in a circus. But here I was having an authentic elephant experience in the wild. And that which we'd had in Australia in a circus or a zoo paled into insignificance. What I want you to say to you in this first talk this morning is this. There is an authentic, momentous gospel in the wild. And there is a counterfeit gospel which is inauthentic. It's Christianity skim milk. Christianity light and the tragedy is that the majority of Christians on this planet are trusting in this inauthentic counterfeit so-called gospel and I put it to you that this is how it happens we know that we need to come to Christ for salvation we're saved by Jesus and faith links us to him but as I continue in the Christian life my focus shifts from Jesus to my own works. And it's through Jesus I know that I sit at the table of God. But I've got to work like crazy in order to maintain my chair at the table of God. So I'm saved through faith in Jesus, but I now continue by faith in my own works. Now, in Sydney, I go to a gym, which is about the third the size of this building. It's owned by a Roman Catholic man, and the other men who are there, when I'm there, are Roman Catholics. They've become very good friends to me. I know they really like me, because in Australia, you show your likeness by being rude to one another, and they're always rude to me, so I know they actually like me. But I'm the only Protestant, and they're always having a go at me about that. And I say, it's possible to be certain and sure that you're in right relationship with God. And they say, that is impossible. Because Roman Catholic dogma, of course, says that you trust in Jesus plus a blend of your own good works. And you can never be sure that you do your part. And so assurance and certainty is actually a sin. Now, with all the diversity among us, all the many ways we come, Galatians remind us that there is only one true gospel, one gospel in the wild. It is an exclusive gospel and it is momentous. 
I want you to flip back, if you would, to Acts chapter 14, and that's where we're going to begin our study on these morning devotions in Galatia. In Acts chapter 14, verse 28, the Apostle Paul comes to the end of his first missionary journey along with Barnabas. They come back to their sending church, which is the church at Syrian Antioch. And it says, Luke tells us that they stayed there, Syrian Antioch, a long time with the disciples. I take it that the year is about 48 or 49 AD. Uh, in Acts 15, you'll see immediately what happens. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So these were men who were Christians who had been Pharisees and they come from Jerusalem telling the new believers in the Galatians area and in Syrian Antioch that they had to be circumcised and as well keep some holy days and keep the church season. Now Galatia is not a city. Galatia, Galatia is a region like Sabah or Sarawak or West Malaysia. And Paul and Barnabas had visited the Galatia region in the first missionary journey. And many of the people who responded to the gospel were actually Gentiles. And then these missionaries come from James in Jerusalem and you can imagine them being very convincing. Well, we want you to know that the gospel you receive from Paul is not a true gospel. Paul is not a true apostle. After all, Paul only saw Jesus after Jesus was ascended. His gospel is inadequate. He told you nothing about circumcision. We are telling you that we are from the mother church. The Old Testament scriptures are our scriptures. Abraham is our father. Our Christology is orthodox. We believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. We believe that he lived a perfect life, that he died, that he rose bodily. We believe all that. We have no argument there, but we want to urge you to regularise your experience, show your solidarity with us by the covenant sign given to Abraham, the sign of circumcision. In other words, to become a Christian, you really need to become a Jew first. And therefore they are saying that the gospel of Paul, focusing as it does on Jesus, is an inadequate gospel, that Christ's work is not sufficient, it needs to be supplemented. Now, of course, that is why Martin Luther called Galatians his favourite epistle. It was like his wife. Because he lived in a day of supplements, and supplements, additives, are actually poisonous. The question is, how can I be right with God and how can I stay right with God? We would tell our children when they went to university, if someone comes up to you on the campus and says, are you a Christian? You say, yes, I've got faith in Jesus. Oh, that's not enough. You also need this. We would say, turn your back and walk away because whatever additive they are insisting on is taking away from the complete work which Jesus has done. And dear friends, the tragedy of the Galatians is this. They had come from unbelief to belief and now they were being encouraged to move to misbelief. And Paul's response there is in verse 1. He introduces himself, Paul, literally little. He was little Hermes, not Zeus. Uh, Barnabas is what the uh, people had called him in chapter 14. But Paul insists that he is a true apostle, he is a sent one. And notice he says there that he's not sent by any human agency, but he is sent by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of this Jesus establishes his lordship, but it also verifies Paul's apostleship because it is the resurrected Jesus who has called him and made him an apostle. In other words, Paul deals straight up front. He is an authentic apostle and therefore his gospel, his message, is an authentic message. Look at verses 3 to 5. He says the cause of this gospel is grace, God's undeserved favour. God is never in our debt. What God does for us is never an award for good behaviour. The effect of this gospel, he says, is peace, grace and peace to you. And he says that this gospel is all about, look at verse 4, a rescue operation. A rescue operation planned by God the Father, carried out by God the Son. So verse 5, it magnifies them, it magnifies God the Father because it's his plan to rescue us. And it glorifies God the Son because he carries this plan out. 
This is the authentic gospel. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. He did not say, I've done my part, now it's over to you. This is a rescue from this present evil age dominated by the evil one. Jesus doesn't help you and then leave you to your, do your part. He rescues us completely from this present evil age. Now, it's a great opening to the letter. And you may expect, if you're used to reading Paul's letters, that immediately he'll some, say something warm to the people of Galatia. We thank God every time we think of you, but he doesn't do it. Verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. I am shocked that you are embracing a different gospel. And it's no gospel at all. Look at verse 7. He says, what they're trying to do is a perversion of the true thing. And then he repeats it doubly in verses 8 to 9. Even if we are an angel from heaven, even if I come back and say I've changed my mind, if we preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As I've already said, so now I'll say it again. If anybody preaches to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Paul's gospel is God's gospel. Paul is God's apostle. This is not one version. And that there are many versions. There is only one gospel. What they are trying to do in making this additive of circumcision is actually a perversion of the gospel of Christ. These so-called missionaries from Jerusalem, not all missionaries are good missionaries. It just depends on the gospel that they're sharing. It needs to be the authentic gospel. He said, well, wait, 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 come on. Is, is Paul serious? Eternal condemnation? Isn't that an overreaction? Isn't he taking things too far? Why, in the, in the Romans, he says, when you've got a weak brother, deal with them gently. That's hardly gentle dealing. And what about what he put up with in Corinth? Divisions, immorality, unruliness. Surely this is just a slight modification of the gospel. After all, later in the letter he says circumcision is nothing, so why make such a fuss? Act 16, he has Timothy circumcised. And yet someone said Galatians is the fighting letter. What's going on? Christ saves us completely. How can I be right with God through the work of Jesus? If that needs supplementing then it is inadequate. See, there's an enemy. And his purpose is to bring destruction. And when destruction doesn't work, he distorts. And that is what is happening here. Now notice, the Apostle Paul is not saying, I'm the only one preaching the one true gospel. No, there are many who do that. What he is saying is there is only one true gospel. And don't let the world out there say, well, that's just your version. Spurgeon talks about going to a chapel in Suffolk in England to hear his grandfather preach. And he gets there a little late. He interrupts the sermon when he comes in. And his grandfather says, here is my grandson. He may preach the gospel better than I can, but he cannot preach a better gospel. There's only one. And notice Paul is saying that he can live with so much. He can live with the weaker brothers. He can live with those who are badly motivated. But he could not tolerate the idea of two gospels. Content and message are vitally important. You add to that gospel the necessity of doing these things in order to be saved. Law, ceremonial additives, denominational emphasis, whatever it is. It's like the author of the book says, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. This gospel of rescue focused on the work of Christ, glorifying to God with grace as its source and peace as its effect. Look at what he says in verse 11 and 12. It's not man-made. I want you to know that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I want you to know that I didn't learn this because I went to the right college. I didn't sit in a lecture and learn this or have a tutorial. 
I didn't come to this conclusion by reason or by the observation of the created order. Now, there are those out there who say this gospel is foolish. You could, I could not have dreamed it up. Could you? The possibility of living in light, right relationship with God and yet at the same time being sinful. And yet that's the reality. How could we have known that the righteousness which God requires is the righteousness which God provides if God had not told us? Every other relationship I life in, in life I have is conditional on my behaviour. But here is an unconditional relationship based totally on the work of another. I'm in the right with God because God declares that I am in the right with God and I could only have come to that and Paul could only have come to that by revelation. And so Paul says he's not a researcher. He's not a discoverer. In fact, he was a persecutor. Look at what he says in verses 15 and 16. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I didn't consult any man. By the way, verse 16 is the shortest definition of the gospel in the New Testament. What's the gospel, Paul? I preach him. Preaching him. Paul was not tutored in Jerusalem. He wasn't dependent on the apostolic seal of approval. See what he's saying? Look at verse 17. When I had the encounter on the Damascus road, I went to Arabia for three years. And then I came back to Damascus. And then verse 18, I went to Jerusalem and I met with Peter for 15 days and I saw James as well, but I was largely unknown to the churches there. Now keep in mind what he's saying. He's an apostle sent from God. He's called by the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. This is a gospel of grace. It's all about God's rescue plan. It's not taught, it is revealed. This is the only one true gospel. I am an authentic apostle and I have an authentic message. Now we're going to go to the end of chapter 2 today. So let's go into chapter 2 verse 1. And Paul says 14 years later he goes with Barnabas to Jerusalem. And they take a converted, uncircumcised Greek by the name of Titus along with them. And he would be the test case. What would the believers in Jerusalem require of Titus? Look at verse 3. Yet not even Titus who was with me was compelled to be circumcised even though he was a Greek. Now notice here is Paul's insight. If these men are from Jerusalem are right and Christ's work does need to be supplemented, then Christianity is just a minor sect of Judaism. Verse 5, we did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. And he says in verse 9, the conclusion, James, Peter and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognised the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they should go to the Jews. So we now see there's one gospel, there's one mission, but there are two mission teams. Peter, James, John, you go to the Jews and evangelise the Jews. Paul, Barnabas, Titus, you take the same gospel and go to the non-Jews. Paul is independent, but he is in complete harmony. And brothers and sisters, look at what happens next. Paul is in the minority. It's obvious here still that Peter is the senior apostle. A lesser man who would have wanted to save face, wouldn't have wanted to embarrass Peter in a public way. He would have gone quietly. But look at what the apostle says in verse 14. Peter was not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel. He was living out a public double standard. And so he earned a public rebuke and Paul says even Barnabas was led astray, Paul's good friend. Paul has sharp insight and he has great strength. What's the issue? Peter is enjoying eating freely with Gentile believers. The men come from Jerusalem who are Jewish believers and they say to Peter, don't you realise that these men you are eating with are uncircumcised Gentiles? You know that they are technically unclean. You should not be eating with them. And so Peter withdraws as he listens to them. 
Fellowship together is based on the work of Jesus. No, Peter said by his actions, it is based on the work of Jesus plus the additive of circumcision or food laws or whatever. Verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all. Paul says here is something which is not negotiable. Peter, by his actions, is saying that to be in Christ is not enough. There is such a thing as being in Christ and yet continuing to be unclean. There is such a thing as superiority and inferiority. There is no class structure in the church. And if you are more inclined to be Peter than Paul, then this is a great example to you and to me. No side issue. It's Jesus only. And that only brings us into relationship with God. And that is the basis of our relationship with God. And that is the basis of our relationship with one another. A friend of mine is a pastor of a large church in, uh, in Australia. His church building is on a large intersection and they have a big sign. This is the sign of the church. This is the name of the church. And then in big blue letters, the words, you're welcome. And one Friday night, someone had come along with a can of paint and just crossed out, put a line through, you're welcome. And put in in red paint, if. The welcome in this church is conditional. You are not welcome. This church will not welcome all who come. And we must ask ourselves in our fellowship, do we make people welcome? And do we receive people on the basis of fellowship, on the basis of their faith, which links them to Jesus plus nothing. Now, dear friends, verse 16 could not be clearer. Look at it. Paul says one thing three times, and he says the opposite three times. He says, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. There's once. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, twice, three times, not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. It is by faith in Christ, faith in Christ, faith in Christ. It is not by law observance, law observance, law observance. Paul does sit at table with unclean Gentiles who are in Christ. Therefore, that's the proof that his people from Jerusalem would say that Paul is false and he's promoting sin. And Paul says in verse 18, if I rebuild the law of God, I am a lawbreaker because the gospel has smashed such law and the oversight of such law. Yes, the law does forbid eating with the unclean, but the gospel of Jesus Christ requires it. And Paul says in verse 19, I died to the law's jurisdiction. I died to that whole system of works and building up my own righteousness before God so that my life is no longer law regulated, but it is patterned by and shaped by the cross. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I take him. Faith, forsaking all, I take Christ and I stand in Christ and my life now is regulated, my identity is in Christ and it is regulated by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Righteousness and law observance do not go together. If law could bring righteousness, then Christ came for nothing. The law is good. It defines sin. It identifies me as a sinner. And it drives me to Christ. But the only way to God is through Christ. If it were not that way, how cruel of God to send Jesus unnecessarily when we could have made it by ourselves by doing the law. And yet if I if I could do the law, I'd soon trust in me doing the law and not trust in Jesus. But you can't do it. So Luther urges us all to take Galatians 2.20 and read the personal pronouns with passion. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. 
the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am eternally secure at God's table because of what Jesus Christ has done. And now I live that life out before him. On the 13th of February, 1966, before many of you were even born, I remember walking up the main business district of Sydney, Martin Place, going to begin my work in Australia's central bank. That day in my wallet I had pounds, shillings and pence, and I could go into any shop and buy anything with pounds, shillings and pence. The next day, the 14th of February 1966, walking up the same street, going to the same work, I knew that I had pound shillings and pence in my wallet, but they would not buy anything. The only thing that they would buy was dollars and cents. They could be swapped over for the new currency. You see, the coming of dollars and cents on the 14th of February 1966 made the old currency, pound shillings and pence, redundant. And what I want to say to you today is the coming of the new covenant has made the old covenant redundant. The coming of Christ crucified to fulfill the law has made God's law redundant. And the problem that Paul is correcting here in the Apostle Peter is that Peter is living as though both currencies are equally valid. And they are not. To make the law continually necessary under the new covenant is to transgress the gospel. There is only one gospel. It is God's gospel. It comes to us by revelation, to Paul by revelation, and to us by revelation through the word. We could never have thought it up. It's all about being rescued by Jesus. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. And Galatians 5 fills that out. Titus is the test case. Christ fulfills the law and makes it redundant. To reinstate the law is to make yourself a lawbreaker. The Muslim has his five pillars. The Roman Catholic has their seven sacrament, sacraments. The Jew has his ten commandments and seeks to establish his righteousness in his own way, Paul says in Romans 10. But we come to trust in Christ and God is always delighted in him. And now we live out the fact that we have been rescued by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My wife and I have two sons. When it came to educating our sons, we heard that there was a school nearby where we lived. There was a remarkable principle at that school. He had been bullied when he had gone to school. And so in this school, he set up a bullying hotline. He said, any parent who thinks that your son is being picked on in this school can ring that hotline at any time. And after office hours, it will come directly to my home. You can be sure that up to midnight, if you ring that hotline, I will answer it. But do not ring that hotline just to find out how your son's going at school and his academic record. I will be angry if you do that. You are only to use that hotline to report bullying or even your sensitivity that it may be going on. Bullying is cruel, bullying is persistent, and bullying was to be stamped out in that school. Brothers and sisters, if you look at history, you will know that there is one persistent bully. There are many bullies, but there's one that's persistent, and that is religion. The religion which requires the impossible and then threatens you with dreadful punishment if you can't do it. And every religion is like that. It is a bully, apart from biblical Christianity, apart from the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. It is by faith in Jesus, not faith in Jesus plus rules and regulations. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Does this mean I can live any way I please? Of course not. Let Galatians speak. Wednesday, we'll come to Galatians 5 and 6 and Paul will deal with that. The issue of license. No, there's not to be any of that. 
But here the problem is taking people back to the old covenant. I stand in Christ. I sit at God's table because of Jesus. I sit at God's table secure because of Jesus. I'm my parents' only son. I have two older sisters. Uh, two weekends ago, before I left for Malaysia, I took my sisters, their family, my family, our children, their, their children, my children, grandchildren, and we all went to the gravesite of my parents. We unveiled the headstone of my parents for the first time. My parents were fine Christian people. Uh, my father became a Christian at the age of 48, which is very late for a, an Australian man. My mother became a Christian one week later. And it was up to me to determine what should be on that headstone. And my parents from Scottish background, of course, were members of a Presbyterian church and they loved the old Presbyterian hymn book. So I looked around for a good Presbyterian hymn and I knew the Presbyterian hymn that the family loved was, uh, how, uh, was the great hymn, I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad, and found in him a resting place and he has made me glad. A bonner hymn. But I didn't choose that. I chose another hymn which stresses today that my parents in eternity are safe and secure before God. Listen to these words. Upon a life I did not live. Upon a death I did not die. Upon another's life, another's death. I stake my whole eternity. Jesus Christ. They're all. Is that your faith? You didn't live the life. He did. You weren't qualified to die the death. He was. Upon another's life, another's death, I stake my whole eternity. Christianity in the wild. Momentous gospel. True gospel. Authentic gospel. Is that the gospel that you live by? Is that the gospel you proclaim? Well, our Heavenly Father, we pray today that you'd help us as we come to grips with this great letter. Please examine us, each of us, our Father, as we look at our own churches and our own pastoral practice. Dear God, that we might make sure that the authentic gospel is at the centre of our ministries. We thank you for Jesus and all that he has done. We thank you that his life was the life we did not live, but he did. His death was the substitute's death. His resurrection was bodily, and his ascension to your right hand was real. And we thank you that our security rests in him and all that he has done. Our Father, we pray that you'd help us to grapple with these things, to see them put into practice, and give us a spirit of gladness as we proclaim them to others. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus, trusting in his merits alone. Amen. Thank you, David, for bringing us God's word this morning.